Today, we're gonna look at two spooky stories about people's run-ins with terrifying creatures. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the Strange, Dark, and Mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please take the like button out to pet some furry cute animals at the zoo, but instead of taking them to the zoo, take them to pet a pack of wild, hungry hyenas and stack their pockets full of hot dogs. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. And also, I am on tour right now, so be sure you follow me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is just Mr. Ballin, where you will see all the behind the scenes magic of us being on tour. It's really good. Again, Instagram, Mr. Ballin is my handle. Check it out. Okay, let's get into today's stories. Just after midnight on May 1st, 1971, a 20-year-old woman named Elizabeth Ford was sleeping on a couch in the front room of a small house near a city in Arkansas called Texarkana. Elizabeth and her husband Bobby were staying at the house with Bobby's brother and his wife, who owned the house. Bobby and his brother were still both awake, and Elizabeth could hear them talking in the kitchen quietly. The house was surrounded by woods and swampland, and Elizabeth had opened up a window above the couch so a breeze was blowing in. Now, usually, she slept really well with the sound of the woods in the background, but tonight, she was tossing and turning. And this was because, as she lay there trying to sleep, she became very aware of a unique sound coming from outside that was not the sound of, you know, the trees blowing in the wind or the insects buzzing. This was something else. It was a slow creaking sound, and at first, it kind of sounded like it could be out in the woods somewhere, but eventually, Elizabeth realized this creaking sound was sort of moving back and forth, back and forth, right outside on the porch, below the open window. Suddenly, Elizabeth's eyes flew open and she looked at the window because this creaking sound had just intensified and then came to a stop on the immediate other side of this window, like there was something heavy right outside. Elizabeth sat up to face the window, but she didn't see anything outside through the screen. And so right away, she felt totally relieved. You know, she didn't know what that sound was, but clearly there was nothing there. However, just to be certain, she decided she would go a little bit closer to the screen and actually look right up close to make sure there was nothing down below on the porch. And so Elizabeth leaned forward and pressed her face to the screen and began to look. And as she did, this dark figure down below suddenly rose up and completely blocked out the window. And Elizabeth's looking at it, having no idea what it is. And before she could do anything, this huge thing slashed at the screen and this big reddish furry brown paw with razor sharp claws cut through the screen and nearly cut Elizabeth's face. Elizabeth screamed and practically fell over and this dark creature outside turned and bolted and disappeared. And then a moment later, Elizabeth's husband, Bobby, and his brother came running into the room asking what was going on. Elizabeth was so shocked at what she had just experienced that all she could say to her husband was, it's a bear, it's a bear. Bobby helped Elizabeth off the couch and then told her and his brother's wife to stay in the house and away from the windows. And then Bobby and his brother got shotguns and flashlights and went outside. Once outside, Bobby and his brother began scanning all around the porch area where Elizabeth had apparently seen this bear to see where it was. They held their flashlights out and they scanned the tree lines. They looked all over the place, all around the front of the property, but there was no sign of this animal. And so the brothers looked at each other and nodded, and then they both left the porch and went different directions, kind of looping around the back of the house. They were gonna scan the entire property and meet up at the back. And when they met up at the back, they still hadn't found this bear. And so they walked away from the house towards the tree line and did another big sweep together of the entire perimeter, again, looking for any sign of this animal, but there was nothing. And so after a while of circling the property, the brothers decided that, you know, this bear must have just run off. And so Bobby and his brother returned to the porch to figure out their next move. Both Bobby and his brother were hunters, and they knew that usually the best thing to do with the bears that roamed this area was to leave them alone. I mean, these bears could grow to be 500 pounds, and if they were provoked, they could run at 35 miles an hour. And so generally, you just stayed away from these things, and they'd leave you alone too. However, as the brothers were sitting there talking through what had happened that night, they both said, you know, it definitely seemed like this bear was different. I mean, apparently it was aggressive enough to come right up to the house unprovoked and reach in and swipe at Elizabeth. 
which obviously was not normal bear behavior. And so, to Bobby and his brother, this meant that they really couldn't just leave this bear alone. They had to go out there and find it and kill it to protect themselves. And so Bobby lit a cigarette to calm his nerves, and then the two brothers came up with a plan for how they were gonna go find this bear. Bobby's brother would man the front of the house, and Bobby would man the back of the house. And they would stay in their respective positions monitoring the property until either they saw the bear and dealt with it, or until the sun came up, at which point they could go get help. And so after agreeing to this plan, Bobby took one final drag on his cigarette, chucked it to the ground, and then with a shotgun in one hand and his flashlight in the other, he stepped off the porch and walked around to the back of the house and stared off into the darkness. Bobby had only been in the back of the house for a couple of minutes manning his post when he began to smell this horrible smell. Now, at first he thought it was just some sort of wet, musky smell that came over from the swampland nearby, but as he continued to smell it, it got heavier and more pungent. It smelled like a wet, decaying animal. Bobby tensed up and aimed his flashlight up at the tree line and began looking back and forth, trying to figure out where this horrible smell was coming from. And as he was doing this, he suddenly heard the sound of tree branches snapping off to his left. And so he whipped his flashlight over and shined it, and he saw this big, dark figure charging across the property away from him into the forest. Bobby instinctively raised his shotgun and fired, and then after shooting, a loud yelp echoed in the air, and then Bobby just took off running in the direction he had just fired. And as he's running across the yard, he's screaming for his brother, who had already heard the shotgun blast, so he was coming around the house. And the two men linked up, and as they're running in the direction of this bear, Bobby's telling his brother, I think I got it, I shot the bear. But they get over to where Bobby had last seen it and where he heard this yelp come from, and there was nothing, there was no bear. Still, the brothers did feel a little relieved. They figured even if they couldn't find this thing, you know, clearly Bobby had hit it. He had heard the sound of it yelping out, and so maybe by at least wounding it, it would stay away and leave them alone. But just then, the men heard the sound of their wives screaming from inside the house. The men immediately ran back to the house, and as they got closer, Bobby, again, began to smell that horrible smell. And right as Bobby's foot hit that first porch step, his brother from behind him screamed out, stop, but it was too late. The bear was on the porch. That's why the women were screaming. They had seen it, and Bobby's brother had seen it, but Bobby hadn't, and now he was too close to it to get away. And before Bobby could raise his gun to protect himself, this thing attacked. And Bobby felt this horrible, burning, tearing sensation in his arm. He fell to the ground, twisting wildly back and forth, trying to protect himself. He was pinned underneath this enormous bear, level with its chest, with its arms and legs on either side of him. And that horrible smell he was smelling was clearly coming from this animal. That's all he could smell from underneath. But just then, it was like a miracle, because to his side, Bobby could see there was an opening, and so he rolled and somehow got out from underneath this enormous creature. Bobby scrambled up to his feet, and he darted past the bear and rammed into the closed front door of the house. It popped open, he fell inside, and his wife ran forward and shut the door behind him, leaving Bobby's brother outside on the porch alone with the bear. But before any of them could do anything about that, they heard the sound of his brother's shotgun going off. Then there was a long moment of silence. Inside the house, everybody was frozen. A few seconds later, the door slowly opened and Bobby's brother walked inside. Everyone was too shocked to say anything, so for a second they all just stared at each other and then finally Bobby asked him, is the bear dead? And Bobby's brother, with a trembling voice, said no. And that wasn't a bear. As soon as dawn broke and it was not dark outside anymore, Bobby's wife drove him to the hospital where they would treat him for shock and for the wound to his shoulder. They had hoped to find it somewhere on the property, either dead or wounded, based on Bobby's brother's account of having fired at it basically point blank, but the creature was gone. They did find its tracks though, and this discovery made it clear that Bobby's brother was right, that this wasn't a bear. Because in the dirt surrounding the house were all these bizarre footprints and handprints of a creature that seemed to walk on its hind legs with three toes on each and had three long sharp claws on its hands. And as unbelievable as this all seemed to the police, this actually tracked with what Bobby's brother said he saw when he was out on the porch. He said he saw a creature with reddish brown hair all over it that stood over seven feet tall, and after being shot, it took off running on two legs, and it ran fast. 
But the most terrifying thing about it, at least according to Bobby's brother, was actually its eyes. They were blazing red. And when the news of this attack spread to the nearest town, which was called Falk, the people there knew exactly what this creature was. For 200 years, people in that part of Arkansas had been talking about this huge creature that was sort of like a Sasquatch that roamed the forest and the swamps. They said it was fast and elusive, and it ate livestock and pets. They called it the Falk Monster, or sometimes the Boggy Creek Monster. But Bobby Ford and his family's encounter with this creature was unlike any other story that had been told about the Falk Monster. While some people claimed in the past that this creature had attacked people, nobody had ever heard of it actually coming up to somebody's house trying to break in and terrorize a family. Bobby's ordeal would inspire the 1972 horror movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek. Over the years, police officers and some scientists have suggested that maybe what Bobby and his brother encountered that night was actually a feral pig. However, authorities have never actually been able to pinpoint what this thing was. Nobody knows. And to this day, hikers and hunters near the swamps of southwest Arkansas and also across the border into East Texas still report run-ins with the legendary Falk Monster. Me and the whole team at Ballin Studios have created a special thank you to all you amazing fans for all your support. Now, you may have already heard about this, but if you haven't, my very first book, Mr. Ballin Presents Strange, Dark, and Mysterious, The Graphic Stories, finally comes out this year on October 1st. But that's not the thank you. The thank you is, for anyone who pre-orders this book, which includes nine feature-length, amazingly illustrated stories, you will immediately gain access to a secret 10th story that's not in this book. This secret story is called A Forest So Evil, and it's really good. So here's how you get it. After you pre-order your book, whether you've already done that or you do it now, you're gonna get a confirmation code. Go to the link we provided below and enter that confirmation code into the text box, but be sure you select the appropriate vendor beforehand where you pre-ordered it from, and boom, you will immediately gain access to the secret 10th story. I am truly touched at all the support you've shown me over the years, and so I really hope you enjoy this bonus story as a big thank you. Again, pre-order your copy today, and then head to the link in the description, enter your confirmation code to get that bonus 10th story called A Forest So Evil. On the evening of August 1st, 2015, a 20-year-old man named Fraser Baloyi walked alone down a main road toward his village in the South African province of Limpopo. Fraser was on his way home from work, and he was pretty desperate to get there. It was only about 7.30 p.m., and usually around this time, Fraser was used to seeing other people out and about on this road, just kind of walking around in the dusk or, you know, chatting or doing various errands, but tonight there was nobody out there. And in fact, in recent days, this area of Limpopo had basically become a ghost town. Nobody went out unless they absolutely had to because over the last 10 days, over 20 people in this area had been brutally mauled. The victims had all insisted that the creature that had mauled them was some kind of four-legged demon, and they had begun calling it the Beast. Now, Fraser considered himself a pretty level-headed person who did not necessarily buy into the hype around this beast. He figured it was very likely just a dog. But still, he didn't want to get attacked. And so as he walked down this vacant road, he periodically looked over his shoulder just to make sure no dog was following him. As Fraser continued to walk along, he looked up and saw the huge forest fire that was raging on a mountain miles and miles off in the distance. A few days ago, the fire had started, and from Fraser's perspective, it still seemed to be going strong. In fact, in the darkness, it almost looked like the mountain was glowing red. Just then, Fraser noticed the turnoff for the shortcut that would take him through some forest back to his home. And when he got there, he stopped and looked over his shoulder one more time to make sure he was still all alone, and he was. And then he stepped off the main road, into the woods, and into the darkness. Under the tree canopy, the night suddenly seemed a lot darker. Fraser did his best to think about the chores he needed to do for his mother once he got home, instead of thinking about the beast. But he'd only been on this path for about 300 feet when he suddenly heard a rustling from behind him. And so right away, Fraser stopped and turned around and looked where the noise was coming from, but all he saw was darkness. There was nothing there. And so Fraser, for a whole minute, just stood there staring out into the tree line, waiting for something to move, but nothing did. And so Fraser told himself he was just being paranoid. Everything was fine. 
and then he turned back around and kept on walking. But pretty quickly, his walk turned into a jog. And he was almost to the end of this path, almost out of the forest. He could see his village, it was right there, when he heard noises behind him again. Except now, in addition to the rustling sounds, he heard a new sound. It was like a wheezing sound, like a sick animal that was breathing heavily. Now, Frazer knew he was not just being paranoid. Something was out there, and it seemed like it might be following him. Without slowing down, Frazer looked over his shoulder again to see what was out there, but again, he just saw nothing. It was just shadows. However, when he turned back around and kept on going towards his village, he heard this loud crashing sound behind him, like a massive animal had leapt out of the brush and landed on the path behind him. And so Frazer was immediately so scared he couldn't even turn around. He just started sprinting toward the village and all he could hear behind him were these loud pounding footsteps as whatever this was was gaining on him. And so Frazer was so instantly terrified that instinctively he just started sprinting off without even looking behind him. And so as he's running, this thing's gaining on him. And again, he can hear this awful wheezing sound coming from whatever this is as if there was something wrong with its lungs. And in Frazer's panic as he's sprinting through the forest, Frazer's telling himself, it's just got to be a rabid dog. That's why it's making those sounds. But he knew that didn't track. This thing is huge. This can't just be a rabid dog. And so Frazer just kept on running and running. And finally, he got out of the trees, back into his village. And at the exact same moment, the pounding footsteps behind him came to a stop. But again, Frazer, he didn't turn around. He's too scared. He just ran for his door. His house was right there in front of him. And he gets to his door. He's about to open it up. And right as he does, he feels this searing pain in his neck. This creature, whatever it was, had leapt and grabbed onto him and bit down on the back of his neck. And so Frazer crumpled to the ground and threw his arms up over his head to protect himself. And with one eye, he can see it's this massive black creature on top of him, chewing on the lower half of his face. And so Frazer, he couldn't even feel any pain. He just began screaming for help and he tried to push it off of him, but he couldn't. And then a second later, a flash of metal came across his eye as his mother and other villagers who had seen this happening and heard him screaming came out and began smashing whatever this was with shovels. And so a second later, Frazer's pulled away and dragged towards his house and this huge black creature, it marched over to the edge of the tree line and just stopped, turned and looked back at Frazer and his mother and the neighbor. And Frazer, as he's sitting there in total shock, he can tell that whatever this thing is, this enormous dog-like creature, this had to be the beast. That's what just attacked him. And in this moment, Frazer realized, you know, this creature may have the shape of a dog, but it was not a dog. South Africa has its share of wild dogs, jackals, and hyenas, and typically they're multicolored and fairly small. And this thing was jet black, pitch black, and gigantic. And when this thing first started chasing Frazer, he'd had that panicked thought that maybe it was a rabid dog. But rabid animals are typically lethargic and confused. And this thing that was 15 feet away from them was absolutely alert and calm. The only thing sick about it was that horrible wheezing sound it would make as it breathed. And as Frazer and his mother and the neighbors just stood there staring at this thing, this creature just continued to stare back at them with piercing eyes and its eyes were not normal. These were not like animal eyes or dog eyes. They were too small and set at the wrong angle. And there was real sentience behind them. They were human eyes. Just then, Frazer's mother grabbed Frazer and yanked him, kind of jerking him back to reality. And he scrambled to his feet and he and his mother and the two neighbors, they took off running back into their respective homes. All the while, this creature just sat there on the edge of the forest, staring still in the direction of Frazer and his home. Once inside of Frazer's house, his mother immediately dialed the emergency number to tell the police about what had just happened. But the police told her they were not gonna send people out there to deal with some dog. And so Frazer's mother decided she would just treat her son's wounds on her own until this dog-like creature had left. And then once it had, she would get him a ride to the hospital. However, as Frazer and his mother stared out the window at this creature, it didn't leave. It just sat there staring back at Frazer and his mother with these hideous human eyes for hours and hours. Finally, in the morning, it was gone. The attack on Frazer was the last straw for the people of his village. They believed the creature that had bit his face was the demon beast that had hurt so many other people. 
And so the elders of Frazer's village came up with a plan of how to deal with this beast. And so a few days after the attack on Frazer, this group of elders went off on a journey up into that mountain that Frazer had seen off in the distance that had that huge forest fire on it. And they were there for two whole days before returning to the village and telling everyone that they had successfully performed a ritual that had appeased their ancestors. And so hopefully now the attacks would stop. And sure enough, they did. They did not see the beast again. At least 40 people in Limpopo had encountered the beast at some point, either because they were attacked or they helped fend it off, like the neighbors did with Frazer. But because this beast was never caught and it did stop attacking the village and just kind of disappeared, nobody ever actually figured out what it was. To this day, people in Frazer's village maintain that this creature was a demon and that it came down from the burning mountain. Because every person, including Frazer, who had encountered this beast, noted its wheezing heavy breathing, as if its lungs had been damaged by smoke. In all, at least 40 people in Limpopo encountered this beast, either because they were attacked or they helped fend it off. But because it was never caught, there is no definitive proof of what it actually was. As many of you may know, the biggest event to ever come out of Ballin Studios is fast approaching. Starting September 26th to October 20th, I will be on tour. I'll be visiting 15 different cities across the country, delivering the strange, dark, and mysterious to you all live and in person. We did one sold out show last year in Austin, Texas at the Paramount Theater. It was sort of like to see if people liked it, and it seemed like people loved it. So we decided to take that format and run with it. On this year's tour, just like in Austin, Texas last year, there will be some OG classic Mr. Ball and stories and some brand new stories that nobody has heard yet. They're gonna be really good. Now, tickets for these 15 different stops have been selling really quickly, but there are still tickets available in cities like DC, Chicago, and Houston. So if you have not gotten your tickets yet, go to tour.ballandstudios.com to see if there are tickets available in a city near you. Again, to get your tickets to see me tell stories live and in person, go to tour.ballandstudios.com. Thank you, and I hope to see you all at one of my shows. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here.